Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, we have five great plants with colorful berries. Host Casey Hinches is busy cleaning up after a pest that litters our landscapes with twigs. Casey brings some tropical bog plants inside for the winter. And at the OSU Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma, we visit with horticulture food crop specialist Lynn Brandenberger about getting the most out of cover crops. As we approach winter, we start looking at our landscape for winter interests. A lot of times we think about hollies with their berries, but we have five plants that have berry-like fruit that aren't hollies. Plant number one. Whether you're an OU fan or an OSU fan and you're looking to add a little fan spirit into your landscape with orange or red, Pyracantha will provide both of those colors. Here you can see we've gone with our favorite color, orange, with this Yukon Bell cultivar. There's also cultivars available that provide a yellow berry-like fruit as well. You can see it has dense branching structure, which makes it a really nice uh, wildlife shelter in the winter time. The other thing that aids in that is the fact that it's semi-evergreen, so it's going to hold on to these leaves, as well as most cultivars tend to have a lot of thorns on them. So that kind of provides protection for that wildlife that might find refuge in this shrub throughout the winter time. There are cultivars that are thornless, such as Waterii. Now Pyracantha and Gustafolio can get some diseases, including fire blight and scab, but the best way to prevent those is just to select a cultivar that is resistant, such as Apache or Fiery Cascade. Depending on which cultivar you select, they can get anywhere from 2 feet tall to 12 feet tall. But there is bound to be one that works for you in your landscape. Plant number two. Blue Muffin Viburnum is another great landscape plant that does well on the edge of a tree line or a forested area. It likes that part sun, part shade uh, location. You can see here it gets to be about five to six feet tall at its mature height. And what we really like about it is it has these blueberry-like uh, berry fruit that it produces late in the fall. Now prior to this, in late spring, early summer, these were white flowers covering this plant and while they aren't fragrant, they make a nice contrast against the dark green leaves. This plant is native to North America and enjoys the clay soils of Oklahoma as well as it's tolerant of growing under the black walnut tree. This foliage will start to turn a little bit fall color as it loses those leaves come wintertime. Plant number three. Calicarpus is another great landscape plant to add to your garden um, and there's four that we typically are looking at, four different species, and this is Calicarpa americana that is native to the United States. What Calicarpus are known for are these weeping branches that have these bright pink or purple berries on them. There are some cultivars that also have white berries if you prefer white over the pink. This is Calicarpa americana, and you can see we've got ours tucked under some cedar trees because they do like to grow again along that tree line where they get part sun, part shade. Being native, they do well here in Oklahoma, and they enjoy our soils, but they are deciduous, so they're gonna lose their leaves, but these berries will persist a little bit longer. 
Calicarpus are deciduous and this one has green leaves, but there are some cultivars that have variegated foliage as well. Plant number four. One of my favorites is this native shrub. It's Euonymus americana, or also known as strawberry bush. Now it is native to Oklahoma and it will naturalize. It's a multi-stem shrub that has inconspicuous flowers. So you're not really growing it for the flowers, but what we're growing it for is this amazing fruit. Um, it has kind of this uh, strawberry-like fruit, hence the name strawberry bush or the common name hearts of bursting. You can see that these hot pink bumpy capsules open up to reveal these red, orangish colored berry-like fruit. It just covers this plant in late fall, which is really nice, but it will drop off. This shrub likes clay soils and moist soils. It's tolerant of growing near black walnut trees and is hardy from zone six to nine. Um, and you might find that the deer also like this shrub. Plant number five. If you don't have room in your landscape for a shrub, you might look at this porcelain vine to give you those berry-like fruit. You can see here it has beautiful berries that come in a range of color from uh, teal to almost a plum color and they're almost kind of iridescent. Now these are on the uh, vine that has a kind of a deeply lobed leaf. This vine is deciduous so it's going to lose these leaves in the winter time and it doesn't have uh, flowers that are that showy. We really grow it for the fruit. Now, there is also a variegated variety available, so it will give you a little more interest. This plant is best grown in full sun and will grow 15 to 25 feet tall as it has tendrils that will allow it to climb up on structures. It's actually related to the grapevine and so it has that same sort of growth habit. You might check out this porcelain vine if you don't have room for a shrub. Well, these are just five landscape plants that you can add to your garden that give you that berry-like fruit. But there are plenty others, such as this Carolina buckthorn that has red berries that turn to this dark black color. So if you're looking to add berry-like fruit to your landscape for that winter interest, there's more options than just hollies. pick up more twigs than leaves this fall, you might be dealing with an insect called a twig girdler. As the name implies, they tend to girdle small twigs, usually twigs that are about a quarter to an inch and half an inch in diameter. And what you'll see is a lot of times uh, it looks like it's a smooth cut or almost like it's been ran through a pencil sharpener because it might still have a point to the inside. What they do is, as an adult, they lay their larvae at the ends of these branches. Now that larva can only feed on dead wood. So in order to make that food supply for the larva, they girdle the small twigs, killing the end of those branches. They're still attached by a small column of wood in the center, but when our fall winds start blowing, it tends to snap those and then the limbs fall to the ground. 
Now, if you want to get rid of the twig girdler, the best way to do that is go ahead and pick up these limbs so that they're not overwintering. This larva will overwinter in these uh, twigs either on the ground or remaining up in the tree. Twig girdlers are longhorn beetles, so as their name applies again, they do have long horns that are usually, or antenna, that are usually about as long as the body of the insect. In its uh, immature state, it's a small white grub that lives inside of that. As the grub eats its way through the stem, what it will do is actually fill up that column that it's hollowed out with some of that chewed up wood and then pupate and then emerge as an adult next August or September, giving it about 10 weeks to then repeat that cycle. So usually we just get one generation of twig girdlers each year. Twig girdlers tend to favor some of our pecans, persimmons, and hickory trees, but they can also go after some of our ornamental trees. Usually they're just more of an aesthetic problem, creating some disfiguring to the symmetry of the shape of the tree. But on some of our pecan trees, they can actually reduce your crop load because that's where the nut is, is on the outside of that tree. The best way to eradicate them from your yard is just go out and pick up those limbs and destroy them so that you remove that insect so that it's not there next season. Even as an avid perennial garden, occasionally you have to break the mold and go get some of those annuals or tropicals just because of the consistent color that they bring to your garden, or maybe they provide some interesting texture and form. With water plants, there's a couple of bog plants that such as the Egyptian papyrus behind us that makes for a nice plant. But they last for one season. We're gonna show you how to extend the life of those by bringing them indoors and bringing them inside in a way other than putting them in your bathtub all winter long. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is go ahead and get your bog plant out of the water garden. And they're pretty tough plants to, to mess with. You can see here we've got quite an overgrown um, Egyptian papyrus. In fact, it's growing out of its container. So we're going to just try to work this out of the pot that it's in right now. And while these are tropical, they're a bit like ornamental grasses as far as how to handle them. So we're going to go in here and just divide this by cutting it in half into divisions. So like this right here could be one plant. So we're just gonna go in here and kind of quarter this up a little bit. Obviously, this plant would have been too large to bring inside, so what we've done is we've quartered it up, and now we have a more manageable plant to protect this winter and bring inside. What we're going to do is go ahead and pot that up. Uh, we have a pot here, and you want to make sure to pot it up in one that does have holes so that we don't have to put water all the way over the pot. We're just going to put water down low. So we've got this here. We're going to get some soil, and this is true topsoil. It's not potting soil. It's just good Oklahoma clay dirt. And the reason why we're using that is because we don't want the soil to float when it is in water. So this clay soil will stay compacted in and around this plant. Now with all water plants, we do want to put some rocks along the top here, and that'll just keep that soil from coming out and also from some of our fish from digging in there later on. But of course we're doing this so we can bring this plant inside as a water plant um, and, and use it as a house plant during the winter time and over winter so next spring we don't have to go buy another tropical annual. So how are we going to keep this bog plant alive all winter long? We're not asking you to fill up your bathtub. In fact, what you can do though instead is get a decorative container just like this one that has no holes in it. So this is gonna be like our micro water garden inside. We've got our bog plant here. 
it is in a pot that does have holes down low, so we don't have to fill this whole container up with water. Instead, what we're gonna do is just fill it up with a couple of inches of water, just enough so that those roots can get that moisture. You're gonna wanna put this in a sunny location in your house. Actually, the moisture that we're adding into this container will add humidity into your home that is often dry in those winter months. You're just gonna wanna keep an eye on that water level uh, and ensure that there remains about an inch or so of water in here for this bog plant. Now, it's not gonna actively continue growing, but it will stay alive and viable for you to take out into your water garden next spring. here at Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma, and joining me is Lynn Brandenberger, the Extension Specialist with Vegetables for the Horticulture Department. And Lynn, you guys have taken out all your crops, your summer crops, you've right. harvested them, mm -hmm. and now we're looking at planting some winter cool season cover crops. Correct. Um, so we've talked about cover crops before and about the yeah. value of them. What kind of cover crops are you planting today? Uh, well, what we're planting right now is a mixture of uh, rye, grain mm -hmm. rye, and uh, crimson clover. Okay. Uh, but we also have two other treatments. One is, is wheat, winter wheat with crimson clover, and then our last treatment that we'll plant will include uh, cereal rye uh, and Austrian winter pea plus tillage radish. So. Oh, okay. So why you're doing all mixes? Why are you mixing some of your grasses with your legume? Uh, well, we like to have those mixtures because uh, the annual grasses like uh, wheat or rye make a lot of organic matter. Mm -hmm. And so they're great for that. Uh, but they stink when it comes to making, getting uh, nitrogen back into the soil for the crop that's going to follow the cover crop. And that's why we always mix a legume uh, cover crop with a grain. Okay, and so so you've got your grains and your legumes mixed and you mentioned uh, your tillage radishes. This is kind right. of one that maybe we, a lot of people don't realize is a good cover crop. What is it doing for the soil? Well, what it really does is it, it roots down very deeply and then when it gets cold, real cold, it will actually die but it leaves this nice hole in the soil strata and then, uh, you know, water enters that, air enters that, it loosens up uh, hard pans that might exist in the field. So. Okay, so with our turf grass, we take the aerator out there, but yeah. you use vegetables, uh, radishes, to kind of create those soil profile pores. Well, that's why they call it vegetable research. Right? <laughs> so are you doing research on these cover crops also? Yes, actually, what we're going to be looking at over the next five years is the amount of organic matter uh, in the soils that we either gain or don't gain. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our treatments, and I didn't talk about that, is uh, just a uh, field that we're not doing anything with. We're just either working the ground with uh, implements or brush hogging, but we're not doing cover crops. So we've got a comparison. Uh, but we'll be taking uh, soil samples at least once a year, maybe twice a year, looking at soil organic matter levels. Mm -hmm and then uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that sort of stuff. Uh, the other thing we'll probably be doing will be looking at compaction on cover cropped soils, probably versus the non-cover crop soils. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but certainly not least would be uh, internal drainage of the water inside the soil. So. Okay, because organic matter was the one thing that you can always add more to your soil, that we're always working to incorporate more, um, and that vegetation is the best way to get that in there. Yeah, it's a great way, uh, especially for vegetable growers. Um, most of our production soils within the state, if they're uh, clean tilled, like we do vegetable ground, will have anywhere from a half to seven tenths of 1% mm -hmm. organic matter. Where we'd like to be is three, four, five percent. I don't know if we can get that high, but that's what we're shooting for. And that takes years to get yeah, it up yeah, it that takes, high. Yeah, it's gonna take quite a while. Now, the great thing about cover crops, uh, especially for vegetable growers, is we don't have any food safety concerns. Okay. We don't have to worry about, oh, we put manure out there and then I planted too soon and I might have 
uh, contamination issues. We don't have to worry about that with cover crops because we don't have any manure involved. Right, right. So, so come spring, <coughs> once your cover crop has come up, what are you going to do in order to get that uh, material into the soil? So what, what we normally do is we strip till, especially for uh, vine crops like watermelons or cantaloupes, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll strip till and then we'll plant in that strip. Uh, before we till, though, what we do is we usually come in and uh, if we had a flail mower, it would be super, but we don't. So we use a brush hog, okay. and we brush hog about a foot or so off the ground, and then after one pass of doing that, then we come back and brush hog it clear to the ground, and then we till. Okay. Uh, but we leave we leave uh, the cover crop between rows. Mm -hmm. We we leave it alone and let it stay there. It, it gives us a lot of wind protection in the spring, and. That's, that's an important thing in Oklahoma is wind protection. Yeah, and early last summer when we were out here looking at the cabbages and stuff, you had the wheat growing in between all of your crops. and Exactly. So, so this time you'll do the same thing, but we're going to see more of a mix of those cover crops. Correct. All right, and do you plant a summer cover crop as well? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, we're using uh, sorghum sedan, or sometimes it's called hay grazer as our, one of our grasses. We're also using uh, pearl millet as the other grass. Okay. And then we're using cowpea, uh, forage cowpea, like we used uh, Red Ripper this year. Sometimes we use iron clay. Uh, but uh, So we'll mix those with those grasses All also. Right. So there's two summer crops that you've mentioned to me before um, that are usually used for wildlife that you tried them. Yes, uh, we tried Lab Lab, which kind of looks like a cowpea, but it's it's a little different species. And then we tried Cesbania, okay. which is another uh, legume. Uh, both of those did okay, but compared to cowpea, they're wimps. Okay. I mean, Why they, are they wimps? Well, they can't take the heat and they can't take the drought. Okay. Uh, they'll just uh, be all, you know, looking really sad and, and like the world's going to end and the cowpeas are sitting there like, Hey, what's the problem with you guys? <laughs> they so, can handle Oklahoma, yeah. the cowpeas can't. Uh, the other thing about those two is that the seed cost is, is uh, a lot higher than, say, cowpea. And you can just find cowpea almost anywhere. We just go down to our local uh, seed supplier and we just buy it. Okay. We don't have to order it or anything. So it's a good standby to use for a summer oh, yeah. crop. Yeah, it's good and steady. All right, well, thank you for sharing this with us. All right, thank you. cover crops in a small garden, we'll do the same thing that we just saw in the larger garden, but we're going to use just our rake to do that. We want to make sure that we break up that soil surface to allow those seeds to get down and have good contact with that soil below. You can see we had a straw mulch on here, so we just want to make sure to break that up a little bit. After we do that, we're then going to scatter our seeds. Here we have a mix again, just like what we saw planted earlier, of wheat, uh, grass, some legumes, and some tillage radishes. Whenever you're planting legumes, you want to make sure that you buy a seed that is inoculated with the rhizobium bacteria. And that's the bacteria that actually does the nitrogen fixing. Um, it lives in the nodules of those legumes. So you can see here how that seed is coated. Um, and then also we've got our wheat seed in there too. We're just going to scatter our seeds along our soil surface here. And our planting ratio isn't too critical um, because we just want to make sure that we have a good coverage of this cover crop. Now again, to ensure that we've got good soil contact, we're going to use our rake and just kind of incorporate those seeds just barely into that soil surface. You can see our soil is pretty moist this morning because it is a fall morning, 
But we're going to go ahead and put a little water just again to make sure that soil contact is secure with the seed. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we're going to plant some potted mums. We'll explore microclimates, and we'll do some garden cleanup to get ready for winter. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Green Lake Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussions.